uh, begin, let's begin with a word of prayer. Um, Gene, would you lead us, please, brother? Absolutely. Father in heaven, we come to you at this time thanking you so much for this period of time that we can come together and that we can study uh, a, a very essential and a very important part of of how to study your word. And Father, we just thank you so much for Brother Tidwell and for the time he puts in and prepares these classes for us. We thank you, Father, for the beautiful earth that you made for us, which is ours to enjoy. We pray, Father, that as we engage in this class, that our minds will be opened and, and that we will learn and absorb and apply these teachings to our lives so that we can help bring others to you, giving you all the glory. We pray, Father, that your, your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's in our, our Savior's name, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Now we're, we're kind of, we went the last couple. First off, before I go any further, let's have, let me ask this question. Did everybody get the video that I, that very short video I gave last week? Yes. Did anybody? I got it. Yeah. Everybody got it. Okay. And uh, last week was kind of a killer week for me. And I apologize about that whole situation, but uh, I did send the link out to everybody. So if you didn't get it, I'll try to send the link out again. Okay. And, but it only lasted maybe about an hour. And uh, cause I was, last week was a stressful week. Okay. Okay. All righty. All righty. Secondly, I also know that um, last week was supposed to be the um, midterm, and uh, I still haven't had the opportunity to make up the midterm yet. And um, but I will get it to you this week. I promise. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, <clears throat> we have been discussing a lot of things here, and one of the things we've been talking about are the rules of hermeneutics. We've been talking the last two, two class sessions on how can we interpret literal language and how to interpret figurative language. A lot of that material came out of w or Dungan's book, Professor Dungan. So again, if you have the book, if you want to have the opportunity to get that, let me know and we'll get that. You can also get it online. So a lot of that material did come out of that. So I just wanted to kind of key you in on that. Tonight, we're going to continue this idea of uh, rules of hermeneutics and how to interpret and back here behind me is the five steps in interpretation of a scripture. Number one, as we begin to look at it, there's first of all, the idea of the literary context. We need to look at the context in the book the passage occurs in. And what I'm going to show you in just a few moments is something that they call the hermeneutic spiral. All right. And in this, we're going to be talking about where you start. You start off with the words, then you start off with the context, then you start off with, or kind of build up from there with everything else the author says about that particular word. Then you look at it from that whole genre, and then you look at it from a whole biblical viewpoint. So we'll be talking about that in a minute. So the literary context is the immediate context in which the book, in which the passage occurs. You have to look at the historical and the cultural backgrounds. And I think I've stressed this all along, but again, it doesn't hurt to continue to look at that from that viewpoint. The word meanings. One of the things we do offer at George School of Preaching is uh, introduction to Greek. Uh, if you've not taken that, that's fine. Greek is a very uh, beautiful language. Uh, and especially when you think about how God used that to Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic to bring about that. So, uh, a lot of the translations of words, and we're going to talk about that a lot whenever we get into the idea of how the translations happen. But one of the things that we really key in on is the fact of how hard it is sometimes to translate one word strictly from that word into another language. Uh, sometimes you have to try to capture the idea, and sometimes that gets to be a problem. So one of the things that we do encourage here at the Georgia School of Preaching, one of the things we're going to try to do with all of our preacher students is to emphasize you need to take Greek and, and just a little bit of Hebrew. You don't have to, you're not going to become, quote, a Greek scholar at it, but what we want to encourage you to do is how to use it to where you can look it up in the original and see what it was, what it was talked about then and, and see how all, of, all that fits together. For example, we, in, in the King James Version of the Bible, you have the word patience. And a lot of times this comes from two or three different Greek words, but they translated all the word patience. Now, patience to a lot of us means different things. Uh, if you're sitting in a doctor's office, the word patience, what? 
you got to be patient to be sitting in a doctor's office, right? <laughs> so there, there's that idea. But then there's also the idea um, of, uh, you know, you're, you're going to be, you know, taking deep breaths. But one of the Greek words that's used for patience, or is used in the King James Version, is the word hupomone, which means to bear up under something. So the New King James Version, a lot of times when they come to that particular Greek word, they translate it not patience, but endurance. I like that word a little bit better because again, it does bring out that idea. So the word meanings do make a difference. You've got to look at the grammatical relationships. What is that? You need to know what the verb is, the noun, the adjective and so forth. And then you need to look at the literary genre. And so as we're looking at that, this, think about the idea. Again, we emphasize the idea of context Context, as I've said before, is so vitally important. Uh, we talk about the idea of um, somebody says, that's the largest trunk I ever saw. The largest trunk I ever saw. But in different contexts, it could be something different. If I am, hey, brother, if I am at the zoo and I say that's the largest trunk I ever saw, I could be talking about elephants, right? Mm -hmm. If I am in a car dealership, that's the largest trunk I ever saw, then what? Oh, I'm talking about the trunk of a car now. If I'm talking about in a luggage store, oh, that is the largest trunk I ever saw. That's a whole totally different picture there. So you see context, uh, you go out there and you're looking at trees. Well, that's the largest trunk I ever saw. So all of that, can, uh, that's what we, again, we're trying to emphasize. And again, we understand that idea as we look at that. So every statement must be understood according to its natural meaning in the literary context in which it occurs. So not only just the immediate context, but also the other context. And then you have a text without a context may become a pretext. And this is what happens a lot of times in the denominational world. Let me give you an example, and this is kind of hilarious, and yet at the same time, if we take verses out of context, and make them say what we want them to say. You can actually have this situation happen. In Matthew 27, verse 5, it emphasizes the idea that Judas, after he had betrayed the Lord, went out and hung himself. Matthew 27, verse 5. Okay. Now I'm stringing together some verses that are totally taken out of context, but pick, get the picture. So Judas went and hanged himself. And then if you follow that up with Luke 10, 37, Jesus will then say, go and do likewise. So, and again, I'm just taking the verses out of context. And then in another passage in John 14, 27, Jesus says, go what you do and do it quickly. So we could having, we could have a literal command as it was taken from pretext of scripture to go out and hang ourselves like Judas did and do it quickly. See, that doesn't make any sense. But again, that's the idea that we, we bring out. And that's again, sometimes the way people use this with regards to salvation. Let me give you another example. Another example when it comes to this is we find in John Romans chapter three, verse 28, taking it out of his context that a man is justified by faith apart from works. Now, a lot of times taken out of his context, you don't see the whole context of the whole Roman, the argument that Paul's making there in Romans chapter three. So you actually have a group of people saying, well, that's talking about what? Faith, faith alone, right? Then you see in James 2.25, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. And so people have a problem with that, okay? And that seems like a contradiction. So then if you go to John 6.29, this is the work of God to believe in the one whom he sent. So now we can actually have, and you, you put those verses together and you actually have them believing what? Faith only. And again, that whole thing plays out. So the smaller the passage being studied, the greater the chance of error. The smaller the passage you study, the greater the chances of error. So let's talk about, did everybody get this? Here's the five steps in interpretation. <coughs> did everybody get that? All right, I'll give you just about two more seconds, brother. One, two, okay, I'm done. We gotta go. No. All right. This is not a bullseye, okay? I'm gonna talk to you about in just a moment what we are gonna be talking about here. This is what is called the hermeneutical spiral. The hermeneutical spiral. 
So when I'm looking at a passage of scripture, what do I need to do? I need to, and as we just talked about these ideas here, I'm going to look and see how each one of these things gets us to a broader and broader sense. It, the idea of the hermeneutical spiral or the hermeneutical cycle brings out the idea, supposing for a second that you are coming up with a lesson in a Bible class, okay? What do you need to do before you try to do this lesson? Well, number one, you need to read the passage, right? And a lot of times what, and I've talked about this before, brother Dan Winkler and I gave you his uh, study acrostic to emphasize that idea, but he would emphasize the idea that whenever you're reading for a particular passage, you need to read it over and over and over again, get the context, get everything like that. Okay. Okay. You got this. Okay. All right. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Oh, I'm happy to work it out. That's what I'm here for. All righty. So, what we're doing here is you, you read the passage in its context over and over again. And whenever you're doing this, you read it, if you have the time, you read it from the view context of the entire book, if you have the opportunity. So if I'm preaching on John, I need to read, if I'm wanting to preach a particular context in John, I need to kind of read through the whole book of John again. So I'm trying to remind ourselves, remind myself what's going on here. So here's the hermeneutical cycle, the circles of context as it was. First off, Right here is the immediate context. The immediate context. So I need to know what that particular verse is saying right there in that immediate context. Then this second ring talks about the book context. How does that particular passage fit in with the entire book? Number three, you need to look at the uh, everything else, the writer, the writer's context. In other words, you need to look and see, for example, the ideal of faith and Paul's ideal about Rome or faith in the book of Romans. Well, I need to not only look at Romans, but I also need to look at everything else he says about faith anywhere else he says it. So you see, we start off with the immediate context. We're getting it back in the book context. We're now in the writer's context. Then you come up to this context. Now we're going to go beyond just the writer's context, but we're going to look at everything the New Testament writers, or if, depending on what passage we're on, the New Testament writers or the Old Testament writers. So I'm going to look at their whole context. So you see, you start with the immediate Go to the book, go to the writers, now to the New Testament or the Old Testament, and guess what the last one is? Then you look at it from the entire context of the entire Bible. Now, as I said, that's the, that's the uh, circles of context. The argument that is often made is whenever you're preaching <coughs> or teaching a class, you a lot of times if you're using books or something like this, and like a lot of people, um, I think... Uh, Macklin Road or Piedmont Road is using this, The Church of Christ by Edward Horton right now. Here's this book particularly here. So you might be reading in here. You need to, if you're preparing this class and you're teaching this class, then you want to look at all these passages of scripture and you want to then start off with these immediate contexts and see how it fits in with everything else to help you to understand what all is going on in that respect as well. So, Again, this, this helps us to do this. Now, if you're doing this in, a, in that sense, you kind of, as I said, you kind of got a, a hermeneutical spiral, right? It starts down, and it keeps getting lower and lower and lower, right? It looks kind of like a tornado, but that's the idea we're trying to go. We're trying to go from here to get it to here so that we can explain it in such a way to where everybody will understand it. Yes, sir? Yeah, that's like, you know, when you <coughs> shared with you before in another this as I said this is the hermeneutical spiral so that you teach and all I shared with you before that a lot of Bibles have these sections one of the things that I was taught to do whenever I was at school was to outline the book now what does it mean to outline it break it down yeah you got to read it you got to break it down 
And, and, and again, this is another word that is used a lot more now. You break it down in, in its pericopes. And this is a Greek word, which means those things are in a, in a certain area, those particular sections. Now, I'm reading from, for example, my New, New King James Version. A lot of this is already broken down. In a lot of Bibles, they do this. For example, I'm preaching on Job the uh, day after tomorrow. But you'll look here in my Bible, and you're probably the case in yours as well. You see those sections right there. They break down these sections, see? And it says that Satan attacks Job's health, and Job deplores. Now, those are outlines. In a very real sense, those are outlines, right? But a lot of times, as I've shared with you before, sometimes that's, those things are added supposedly to help the text or help you understand what's about to be said in the text. But sometimes I've come up with better ideas than that. Okay. So we, you need to outline it for yourself. Look at the theme, look at the structure, look at all of the things that that's bringing out in there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> logical order. You need to kind of figure out the logical order. Why is he saying what he's saying? Okay. I'm no, I'm sorry. That's oh, that's no problem, brother. That's no problem. All right. Whew. Okay. I didn't know, but what the Lord might be coming back or something there. <laughs> <laughs> Only I I've thought got some, a whole lot got some sound in that. I didn't think it sound that either. But anyway. All righty. <laughs> All right. So logical order. The logical order is another organizing principle. All right. So what do you do whenever you try to outline something? You give the introduction, you get the body of the work, you get the conclusion. And so a lot of different things come into play here. You, you, uh, if it's about a story, if I'm, if I'm going to ask you to uh, outline um, the parable of the sower, then you would talk about what the introduction is. What would be the introduction? What led Jesus to say that? Then you would then talk about the text itself, how it broke down and the interpretation of it. And so that's, that's what we're talking about. So again, whenever you're looking at the context, you're looking at the con controlling theme of the entire book, a basic outline of the book, parallel passages within the book dealing with the same subject. Now, I've told you before, and we understand this, Luke tells us why he wrote the book as well as John. John will tell us in John 20, 30, 31, that he wrote the book to create faith in Jesus Christ. First Corinthians, why did Paul write that book? Right. That's a good answer. And that's true of every book, <laughs> but, but you know, that's a good, good generalized answer, but yeah, it was doctrine because they're facing problems, problem of division, the problem of, of sexual immorality, the problem of marriage. Like we don't have that problem today. The problem of what worship, Wor worship, the problem of the resurrection, the problem of the Lord's supper, the problem of, of women's role, the problem, you name it, that, that, book touches with it some way, somehow or another. So you look at it. I've been teaching on Sunday mornings in the Bible class at South Cobb about the prophets. And it started off because some people asked me to teach on Revelation. And, and of course, I gave them my interpretation and, and my understanding of the book of Revelation. They said, well, can you do this with some of the other prophets? And so I'm trying to put it back in its historical background. And I'm trying to show, I just this last week did one on Jonah. And as I was restudying Jonah again, and then Jonah is what we teach this book from, from what? When they were there knee high to grasshoppers, right? He got swallowed by the whale, but I was restudying it again. And I was listening to some other stuff that I had the opportunity to. And this one guy pointed it out and I never saw, I thought to myself, well, that's, that's so true. Uh, everything in that book's backwards. Everything in the book is backwards. Right? Here's, here's what I'm talking about. As an example, Jonah is the prophet of God who should be obeying God, and yet he's the one that's disobeying God through the whole book. The sailors are pagans who worship their own gods, and they have to ask Jonah, and now before it's over with, the sailors believe in God, but not just the sailors, but also the Ninevites because this is the only place we read a scripture where an entire city converted, right? Changed there. And so you have Jonah, 
who's doing everything against what God says, the sailors who become believers, the Ninevites who become believers, and then in the middle of it, in chapter 2 and in chapter 4, you have two prayers, both of them by Jonah, the first one in chapter 2. Lord, I've messed up. I'm sorry. I, I'm down in the, you know, and he talks about seaweed around his head and all that other stuff, and he's, it's like, okay, I, I will obey you. Now, he doesn't like it. Jonah doesn't like obey. You know, he didn't want to go talk to the Ninevites. He wanted them to destroy him. So he said, I'll obey you. And then look at how he preached to the Ninevites in chapter three. He emphasizes the idea of 40 days and you will be what? You'll be destroyed. Now, we got to be very close about this, but he doesn't say anything about God. He doesn't say anything about what they're supposed to do. He just says 40 days and you'll be destroyed. And so what do all the people do? They all repent. And God decides to save them. And so then in chapter four, Jonah's pouting. The only preacher I know of in the world that would pout because an entire city was converted to Christ through his preaching or converted to God through his preaching. <laughs> totally backwards. See, and I never thought I saw that before. And I thought, my, my, my. See, see, and that's the idea. So, <clears throat> As we're looking at this, that's the literary context, the historical context. We need to know that, and I've talked a lot about this. What does a tax collector mean in the New Testament? What do you know about a tax collector? Dishonest people. Huh? Supposedly they're dishonest people. They were dishonest people. Why? They'd skim off the top. Yeah. yeah. And they charge you a little bit extra and you had to pay whatever taxes they said. It didn't matter. And if you didn't, I'll just turn you into the Romans and we'll take care of this whole situation. Yeah. And a lot of them became filthy rich, but a lot of them really, when you get down to it, the Jews looked at them as turncoats. Right? So we don't take it as far as the Jews did in the first century, but we still don't like tax collectors. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you know what I'm trying to say there. So again, there's that, that hostile idea. Um, you know, think about a dog in the Old Testament. It was an unclean animal, right? Yeah. We have them in our houses all the time, right? And that's man's best friend. Context, context, context. That's what, again, boils down to. A contextualization. Understand the historical context behind all of this. Um, so you have to have, understand the biblical message that it would have in its original setting. And I've stressed that all along, okay? And I wanna to continue to stress that idea. We must express biblical truth in our language in ways that most close, closely corresponds to the ideas of the biblical culture, okay? Uh, so again, think about, that's what the purpose of translation is about. And one of the last one, one, of the last one or two classes we're gonna talk about is translations and how we got there. But again, we have to try to get across that, that historical context. All right. Now, the correct interpretation of scripture is the meaning required by the normal meaning of the words in the context. I talked to a minute ago about trunk, right? Think about the hands of a clock, the hand of a poker player, the hand of a minute measurement for horses. That's all the word hand, right? So you see, again, uh, we give a hand of applause to somebody that we like and what they're saying. So again, we have to look at that in that respect. So what do we need to do? We need to perform word studies. And I emphasize that idea. Well, that was an important thing to do. So uh, I will give you, and again, this is some of the things that I will try to do is I will try to give you some of these sources where you can go. The first thing is some of these Bible encyclopedias, some of the Bible dictionaries, uh, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, uh, Holman Bible Dictionary, Erdman's Bible Dictionary. A lot of this stuff is online, free. So go and look and see what it says in, in, that, in those particular circumstances. All righty? Uh, so there's a lot of that. And again, the ideal of we not having to learn it from the entire sentence and the context of the sentence. Let's talk about poetry. Now, I've talked about a lot about the literal language and the figurative language. Poetry, one-third of the Bible is poetry. Now, 
again, as we start thinking about this, and this is what I'm going to spend talking about the rest of the time this evening, how do you interpret poetry? How do you interpret poetry? Well, first off, let's ask this question. How do we usually interpret it? Figuratively. Figuratively, 99% of the time, right? I think I mentioned to you, and again, if I, pause, if I keep repeating myself, I don't remember where I say what to who, okay? So just forgive me on this. But supposedly, I think it was um, uh, the fellow who wrote Going Through the Woods on a Snowy Evening. Um, was that Browning? I'm not sure exactly who it was. And somebody asked him, what did it mean? He said, I was just walking through the woods on a snowy evening. Well, we come up with all these other interpretations of what it could possibly mean. You know, you know what I'm trying to say? And so think about it in that respect. Poetry has it. What is the first poem that we read in the Bible? Anybody remember? If you took my Exodus class, hint, hint, hint. If you took Max's class, and hopefully we'll remember that. I think oh, you slept through that class at that point in time, huh? Oh, you've slept since then. Okay, brother, I appreciate that. And, and I know what you're trying to say there. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The first song we read in the Bible is found in Exodus chapter 15. And it's nothing but poetry. It is poetry. But it's not like our poetry in that we're trying to rhyme the letters. What it does is uses certain, certain ways to do it. He emphasizes this idea. In the idea of, of, of the rhythm, uh, excuse me, there's, there's different things here. Um, in our poetry, we have what we call meter. You have rhythm, rhyme, rhyme, okay? Again, remember this, it's the ideal in our poetry. When we talk about it, it is... Uh, Rhythm, meter, rhyme, assonance, alliteration, and consonance, okay? In other words, and we'll talk about every, every one of those things. What is alliteration? Close to it, it it's, it's kind of, but it, 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 it has about three or four words in the same that always start with the same letter, alliteration, okay? Repetition. Huh, do what? Rep repetition. It's a repetition, okay. maybe saying the same thing with the, but it'll start off with the same letter. Assonance is, is the idea that we are, um, well, let me just look up the actual definition. I want to make sure I get it as best as I can so I, you can help, you can understand that as well. Alliteration is repetition. Repetition, right. Uh, assonance is a repetition of a sound, a vowel, or a diphthong, okay? Like penitence and reticence. Okay, did you hear that penitence, reticence? That's the idea of assonance. It's the idea of a repetition of the sound of a vowel or a diphthong in non-rhyming stressed syllables. Near enough to echo the sound. You're echoing the sound, okay? You're echoing the sound. Um, here's an example. Clap your hands and stamp your feet. All right, now hear the vowel clap your hands and stamp your feet. You hear the vowel repeated over and over again. So that's what we're talking about. All right. Try to light the fire. Try to light the fire. Okay. You hear that I sound again over and over again. It beats as it sweeps and it cleans. Okay. Now what's he talking about? It beats as it sweeps and it cleans. Ooh. A vacuum cleaner. <laughs> okay. So there, there's, there's that idea of the word assonance. Okay. Looking up the word alliteration. So again, I give you this idea. Um, um, alliteration. All right. The occurrence of the same letter or sound at the beginning or adjacent or closely connected words. Here's one. She, she sells seashells by the, Seashore. Now, how many of us could say that quickly? I, I struggle with that. Peter Piper picked a pickle pickle punch. I practiced on that one. All right. But you see what I'm saying? And it's hilarious to us. It becomes somewhat hilarious to us as we're listening to that, to that very idea. So that's again, what he's trying to emphasize. He's emphasizing here, this idea of this, uh, of meter rhyme consonants and so forth like that. Now, <clears throat> 
let me give you some examples. Let's go to Nahum chapter three, verse two through four. Nahum chapter three, verse two through four. Now, to kind of give you a background of this, Nahum, Jonah went and preached to Nineveh, right? <coughs> uh, Nahum also preaches concerning the destruction of Nineveh. All righty. Uh, Jonah had preached to them and had, they had repented, but now we're down to about time later on where Nahum is preaching. And again, as we come to chapter three, listen to the poetry as he's saying it. All right. We start off chapter three, verse one. Everybody have it. All righty. We're looking at chapter three at verse one. And he says this, woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. Okay, so all through this book up to this point in time, he's talking about Assyria being bloody. And again, go back and study the historical context. Assyria were vicious people. In 655, uh, Tiglath-Pileser actually wrote on a stele, which is a, a steel car, um, um, uh, rock column, how they went and defeated the Elamites. And he said he went through, they went through there. And, and some of the things, what they did, these, these people were vicious. Uh, they'd go through there and they would slaughter all the inhabitants. If you were part of the Elamites, you would probably, and, and they would actually have pictures where they have heads just in baskets, where they're chopping people's heads off. All right. In another part of the thing that he wrote, he talked about the fact that he took some of the captives and made them grind the bones of their friends to grind the bones of their friends, and then they themselves would have their heads cut off. Real nice fella, isn't he? I mean, so you start thinking about all the horrible things that happened during World War II, uh, you know, it's kind of that same idea. And, and so Assyria was just this kind of city. It was this bloody city. Now look what, look what happens in verse two. He says, woe to the bloody city. So that suggests what? They're about to be punished. So then what do you have? The noise of a whip the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, clattering chariots, horsemen charged with bright sword, glittering spear. There are multiple of slain, a great number of bodies, countless corpses. They stumble over the corpses because of the multitude of the harlotries of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. Now, look at what he's emphasizing here. What is he describing as he's just talking about the fall of Nineveh? The noise of a whip. I hear the chariot tears whipping the horses going through the city. You can hear the, the noise of the rattling wheels off the chariots. Okay. One of the things the Assyrians were well known for was not just their infantry, but they were also known for their charioteers. And a lot of times it was the archers that were shooting from these chariots, but it wasn't just that Babylon, Babylon was able to do that as well. They had, Assyria was the first real nation empire that had a standing army. Back and study the history there. It's interesting. So here you have the galloping horses, the, the clattering chariots. You have horsemen. Now guys on horses charging with bright sword and a glittering spear. It's sharpened. They're polished. So as you I see, and we've probably seen the movies where they're going through slash and everything that's coming down through the pike. All right. Do you hear this poetry? Now you're beginning to see the vision here. And then what? A multitude of slain. Every time they cut, somebody's drops. They're killed. They're dead. Countless numbers of bodies, countless corpses. Now what's he saying? What's he, what's he emphasizing here? That's what's happening to Nineveh. That's what's happening to Assyria. The Babylonians did that. Well, why? Why is she being punished? Now, you see, we're going a little further. Because of the multitude of the harlotry, spiritual unfaithfulness. It calls Assyria a harlot. And again, that automatically comes to our mind about that idea. We see the poetic way of saying it. And then what does she do? Well, here the harlot, what, is, what does a harlot do? She sells herself. Interestingly enough, this same figure will be used of Jerusalem and Judah, selling herself to all the other nations in Jeremiah and some of these other passages. So you see, he's emphasizing this. And he says, 
this mistress of sorceries who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. Why is she being punished? Because she has not been, now you're sitting there thinking, well, Assyria didn't know anything about God. Assyria started off as a city by the name of Asher. That's how God's name, Assyria, Asher. She, they worshiped, they thought Asher was the God of all, all gods, and then Ishtar was the goddess of war. But you see, this goddess of war led them to believe in their own indestructible forces. And what's God saying through Nahum? You will be destroyed, right? And so you think about how this play, and, and notice again how he, he gets very interesting in verse five, and it's not something we want to preach out in the pulpit, but what does he say? God said, I'm against you. I'll lift your skirts over your face and I'll show the nations your nakedness. So again, you're thinking of the vision of the harlot and now the skirts being lifted above the face. Shame, degradation, you see? And I will cast abominable filth upon you and make you vile. You see, that's poetic language. And then he finally says, none of it is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Where shall I seek comforters for you? There's not going to be anybody that's going to comfort you because God is punishing you. How can God judge a nation that didn't even claim to follow him? Well, they had the preaching of Jonah, and at one point, a whole group did, didn't they? A whole poor group repented. Same goes on, but you see, it always emphasizes if we're looking at all of this, what? God's in control of all the nations. Sometimes we forget that as well. So you hear this idea here, the crack of whips, the clatter of wheels. Again, you're reading through this very closely. There is short words that brings out the idea of, of all that's going on there. All right. Um, <clears throat> look at Isaiah chapter five, verse seven. Now in Isaiah here, he's, we're changing the context a little bit. He's talking about his own people. In Isaiah, he uses the figure. We've talked about figurative language a lot, have we not? He uses the figure and he compares the figure of his people to a vineyard. Now a vineyard is something that you've got to take a lot of care of, right? If you're going to have grapes or something like that, you've got to take good care of it. So he said, let me tell you about my vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones. He planted it with the best vines. He built a tower in its midst and made a wine press in it. And it, he expected it to bring forth good grapes. But it brought forth bad grapes. Now, interestingly enough, Jesus will use the same figure of a vineyard and talking about his relationship with his disciples, right? I am the vine, you are the what? Branches. And every person that stays in me shall bring forth what? Good fruit. But if it doesn't bear good fruit, now notice, I've always loved that passage in John 15. He says, if they're bearing good fruit, what's he going to do? He's going to prune it. And what do you do when you prune a vine? Make it grow. You cut it back. Cut it back. Make and it, it hurts, you know. I, I've got a running rose bush right close to my house. And uh, so all through this year, I've cut off the flowers just as soon as they bloom. And that continues to help it to bloom and continue to help it to bloom and continue to help it to bloom all the way through there. But whenever fall comes and it kind of dies down, I'm going to cut the thing back just about to the ground. And it's going to start all over again. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> You have a lot. Then when you finish, mm -hmm. like, oh, did I butcher it? Yeah. But what's interesting, that's what promotes its growth. Yeah. Now, think about that from the viewpoint of how often we try to avoid discomfort and how we try to avoid suffering. And yet that's the way God helps us to grow. Look at the story of Job. God allowed Satan to test Job lost family, lost his income, lost his health. His wife says to him, what? Curse God, God and die. Be over with, right? Because I don't want to see you suffering this way. Think about what Miss Lot or Miss Job lost. Think about that for a moment. 
And so you see, you, you begin to understand what, what was happening there in that respect. So we go on, uh, I get off on these tangents, please forgive me. He says, then says in verse three of Isaiah five, oh, now inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done to my vineyard than I, than I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, it bring forth wild grapes? Let me tell you what I'll do with my vineyard. I'll take away its hedge. It shall be burned. I'll break down its wall. Walls protection, right? He says, it will be trampled down. I'll lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug. And there shall come briars and thorns. And I'll command the clouds that there rain no rain on it. Verse 7 tells us exactly what he's talking about. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but he found depression. He looked for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. So you see in that figure there. Now, this is interesting. In the Hebrew, in the Hebrew, this is how, it's, this is, how it is. He looked for justice. The word justice is the word mishpat, mishpat, okay? He looked for justice, mishpat, but he saw mishpak, bloodshed. Mishpat, mishpak. He looked for righteousness, to sedaka, to sedaka, but he heard cries of to sedka, to sedka. Now in the Hebrew, you see the play on the words. Mm -hmm. You hear the play on the word mishpak, mishpak, to sedaka, to sedka. Those play on words. And that's what, how a lot of these times, there, there's that word play there. Now, again, you don't really see that in what? You don't see that in English, do you? Yeah. Because why? We can't get that, right? We, we, we really struggle with that. Let me give you another example. In Psalms 6, verse 10, may all my enemies be yabushu and dismayed. May they turn back yabushu. May they be suddenly dis be disgraced, Yaboshu. You see, ashamed, turn back, disgraced. And in the Hebrew, it's Yaboshu, Yash, Yashubu, Yaboshu. Now, for, please understand, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, and I'm doing the best I can with those pronunciations, all righty? Okay? But you see what I'm saying? John, John, Jeremiah 1, 11 and 12. I see the branch of an almond tree. I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. Okay. There's, the, there's, there's that. But now here it is in the Hebrew. I see the branch of a shaked. I am watching shoked. Shoked, shaked. Shoked, shaked. To see that my word is fulfilled. All right. So. <clears throat> and there you have these this play on words and it's over and over and over again found in the Bible. But a lot of times we don't see it because again, when we're trying to translate the word from that particular language to a language that we can understand, we lose that play because there's no, there's no same play of words on our, in our end, but we play on words all the time. Don't we? We really do. Mm -hmm. So you see it's each language has their play on words. And in this particular circumstance, this is what, this emphasizes the idea that we're trying to bring out. Now, as we continue to look at this idea of, um, think about it in this respect. Matthew 16, 18, most of us have heard this sermon. Upon this rock, I will build my church, right? Thou art Peter. Thou art what? Right, Petros. But upon this rock, Petra, I will build my church. Now you see, there's a whole different thing between Petros and Petra, but it's still a play on words, isn't it? And you probably heard that play on words because it's talked about a lot whenever they're preaching on Matthew chapter 16, right? So, all righty, let's listen to some other examples of biblical poetry. Again, uh, one of the things that we really need to look at here is the idea of parallelism. Now, what is parallelism? Well, the word parallel. You have two parallel lines. They're going to be saying the same thing. Now you've got, as I've told, I mentioned this before, and I think I even wrote this down, but we're actually going to get into the discussion of it. You have what is known as synonymous, synonymous parallelism, where the 
poetry is saying the same thing just in different words. You have what is called antithetical, antithetical parallelism, where what? One line says one thing, and then the other one tells you the ex exact opposite. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. And then you have, uh, let's see. Um, I want to make sure I get this straight, but I'm also going to try to help you to see exactly where it's brought out. Um, how do you get parallelism and How do you get parallelism? It's saying the same thing, just in different terms. Okay. Okay. It, it, well, it's saying it, but, but it's, it emphasizes, uh, okay, uh, synonymous, antithetic, and synthetic. There's the third one, synthetic. Now, we're going to look at some examples, going back to what you're talking about just now. There's some examples. All righty. All right, let's go to Proverbs 19, verse 5. Proverbs 19, verse 5. All right. Now, a lot of the Proverbs are parallelism, okay? In fact, most of them are. They will say the same thing or they will come back and reverse them. So he said, Proverbs 19, verse 5, a false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies will not escape. So you have in Psalms 19, verse 5, does everybody have this part? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's, let me get over here for a minute. Let's look and see. All right. Let's look at this sentence here for just a moment. All right, so you have a false witness in the first part. And then the next part, he says what? He who speaks lies, right? So there, we know he's talking about the same group of person in that respect. A false witness will not what? Will not go unpunished. Right? And the lie, he who speaks lies, will what? Will not escape. So, what do we have here? We actually have, it's saying the same thing in two different ways. A false witness is the same as a liar, will not go out unpunished, and will not escape. Saying the same exact thing. So this goes back to the idea of synonymous parallelism. It's saying the same thing in these two what they call die stitches, okay? There's two parts of it here, all righty? All right. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> uh, this is called an echo. Echo. Because what is it doing? It's saying the same thing, right? This is called an echo. A equals B. A equals B. All right. So that's all it is. And so it's saying the same thing in just different words. It's called an echo. All righty. Um, let me give you another example. Matthew 1130. Matthew 1130. So you see, it's not just in the Old Testament, but it's also in the New Testament. And so hopefully we'll be able to see these things happen. Listen to what he says here in 1130. He says, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is what? Light. Okay, so what are the two things? Yoke and burden are the same thing, right? Easy and light are the same thing. So it's an echo. That's all it is. All righty. Now, let me give you another example. And this is what's, uh, as I said, this is synonymous parallelism, antithetical parallelism, and synthetic parallelism. There are other ways to look at this. Uh, you have an echo. Okay, we just saw that one, but now let's talk about a contrast. A is not equal to B. All righty, now let me give you an example of that. Uh, go to Proverbs 11.20 again. Back to Proverbs again. Proverbs 11 verse 20. Last, or a couple of quarters ago, I taught the book of Proverbs, and I was very impressed 
again, it's one of those books that a lot of times when we teach on, we just kind of gather all the Proverbs together that talk about the same thing. But I was extremely impressed about how a lot of these Proverbs and in the context of the passages, how they do fit together. They're not just sitting there all by themselves. and They're all fitting together in one way or another. So Proverbs 11, verse 20, who's got it? Read it for me. They are all forward hearts, are abominations to the Lord, for such as are upright in their way, and the way are his delight. Okay, say it to us again one more time. They that are of a forward heart are abominations to the Lord, for such as are upright in their way are his delight. Okay. Listen to what the New King James says. Those who are of a perverse heart are an abomination to the Lord, but the blameless in their ways are his delight. All right, now let's, what's going on here? A does not equal B here. So now we have a contrast, right? He's drawing a contrast here. All right. What's the contrast? Perverse and blameless. Perverse and blameless. All right. You have the perverse person. And then you have the blameless person. And what is the reward for the perverse person? They're an abomination to the Lord. The blameless person are what? In his delight. So you see that the whole thing just contrasts there in that respect. All right. Let me give you another one. A parallel may contrast without it necessarily being antithetical like this. Uh, Judges 5.25. Judges 5.25. Judges 5.25. <clears throat> Here we have the song of uh, Deborah. After <clears throat> J.L. had killed, um, she, uh, what was the name of that guy? What was the name of the, Sisera. There we go. He had, she had killed Sisera. Now, in Judges chapter 5, verse 25, here again is this, listen to this. He asked for water. He gave him what? Milk. Milk. Yeah. Now, that's not necessarily a contrast as much as it's what? It's a little different. There's a difference there in the fact that what? He it's almost, sar it's almost it's sarcasm. Milk. Huh? It's almost it's, sarcasm. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what had happened? Well, he was tired. He took the milk. It may very well be because, again, he was exhausted from running, all exhausted from the battle. I've never been in battle, but I've been told that your, your, your adrenaline is up super, super, super high at that stage of the game. So you, whenever you finally crash, what happens? Oh, you're going to have a bad crash, right? Some folks don't ever really deal with it that way, and that's called post-traumatic stress syndrome, right? So the thing is, is here she gives him milk. And what happens a lot of times whenever we <laughs> – Whenever we can't get to sleep, what do we drink? We drink a little milk. Why? There's something about it that soothes us. And again, that's probably what helped him go to sleep in the way that she did. All right. So you have echo, you have contrast, you have an idea of subordination. Echo, contrast, subordination. So the first sentence in, or the first point will make a point and the second one will complete it. So, you know, it's kind of like A is greater than B. All righty. All right. Let's go to Psalms 111, verse 6. <clears throat> he has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. All right. So what's he doing? It's completing it. it B is completing it. All right. So he's shown his people the power of his works. How? By giving them the lands of other nations. So there's still the parallelism, right? But now B is, is completing the section in A, right? So we go on in the book of Exodus, that first song that I mentioned earlier. In Exodus 15, let's look at this one. Exodus 15, the first song of the Bible the first real poetic uh, statement that we really read. And he says this, <clears throat> verse one 
I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. How has the Lord triumphed? The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Who destroyed the Egyptians whenever they followed them? God did. God did. You know, Moses didn't do it. So you see, he says, why should we sing? Okay, number one, the first point is this. I will sing to the Lord. All right, why should I sing to the Lord? Here's the reason. He's highly exalted. He's triumphed gloriously. Well, what has he done to be triumphed gloriously? Well, he destroyed the horse and his rider. Here's the reason. So here you have a statement, the reason, and the example of what's going on here. All righty. <clears throat> In Psalms 137, verse 1, I'm not going to look at every one of these passages, but just give you some ideas. By the rivers of Lebanon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. Psalms 137, verse 1, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. Well, there's the statement. So by the river of Kibar, they would be weeping. Okay. Why? Because they remembered Zion. Because they remembered Zion. All righty. So you have the idea of echo. You have the idea of contrast. You have the idea of subordination. And uh, let's take a five-minute break. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> okay. Okay. All righty. I will pause this. Okay, we're back. I'm glad to see everybody here again. Um, we're continuing our study of this parallelism, the ideal of parallelism. We've talked about the parallelism of subordination. And that's kind of where we stopped a few moments ago in the idea that um, he has shown the power of his works. He's given them the land of other nations, so A is greater than B. How do we know the power of his works? Well, this is just one small way we can know it. Um, we talked about Exodus chapter 15. Sing to the Lord. There's the statement, for he is highly exalted. Why is he highly exalted? The horse and his rider he has hurled into the sea. Uh, and then we talked about sometimes the subordinate may su express the idea of time. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. How long? You know, while we were there because we were in, we remembered Zion. All right. Isaiah 40, verse 1. Isaiah 40, verse 1. Or excuse me, verse 9. I'm sorry. Isaiah 40, verse 9. <clears throat> you who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. So you, you, you see the continuation of the idea. So here you have somebody that's bringing good tidings to Zion. All right. What is he supposed to do? He's supposed to go up on a high mountain, right? All right. What's he supposed to do? You bring, now here, here, here he says again, you who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. You see the progression now? You lift it up. What do you say to them? Here is your God. Right? So it's a continuation of the same idea here. Well, he keeps going further and further and further. You're shouting it, and now what is the point? You're, you're trying to make that point. All righty. You have a puzzled look on your face? Anybody? Uh huh. Right. Right. And what is the point he's trying to make? What's it getting this down to? He is your God. Here is your God. Here is the one you need to worship. Here's the one you need to study. All right, go Psalms 103, 13. Psalms 103, 13. All righty. Psalms 103, 13 says, as the father pities his children, so what? The Lord pities those who fear him. So here you see this, this comparison. So he compares it. And a lot of times in scripture, you'll find that God is calling himself a father, right? Uh, Paul will talk about the fact in the, the, the Thessalonian brethren, he said, I treated you as a nurse. Remember that? The church there in Thessalonica. 
So you have those, those ideas where he's making that comparison. The Lord has compassion on those who fear him. All right. I'll give you another example. Sometimes, and we talked about the idea of implication. What is implication again? What is implication? Something that's implying. Right. You have a statement that implies something or emphasizes something in that respect. So in Psalms 125, verse 2, those who trust in the Lord are, my, are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. Now, key in on that idea. So you have Jerusalem. And what does he say about Jerusalem? The mountains surround Jerusalem, right? And mountains, in its very real sense, was a protective device. If you wanted a stronghold, you wanted to build up in the mountains. Why? Any army coming after you, they'd have to climb the mountains. And that's, that's tough to do, right? Yep. So you have these mountains surrounding Jerusalem. He said, now, in the same respect, and here's the comparison. So Yahweh, what? The Lord surrounds his people. What does that suggest? Protection, right? From anything that might come out across that way. So again, it's implicit. As the mountains protect Jerusalem, so the Lord protects his people. Beautiful fall. Beautiful fall. All righty. Uh, look in Matthew 7, 11. Here's another one. And here's arguing from what we call the lesser to the greater, right? All right, look at Matthew 7, verse 11. We're looking at the Sermon on the Mount here. And here again, you hear this figure of speech. He says, What man is there among you who, if he asks his son for a bread, will give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now he's making it again. It's kind of the same argument as we said earlier, as the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. So he says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will God give good gifts to us? The important gifts, the gifts of salvation. So what is the main point here? What is the point Jesus is trying to make here? Your heavenly father is going to bless you much, much more. Yeah. Any earthly father ever will. Right? The Hebrew writer will make the same argument in a sense in Hebrews chapter 12, where he says, A father disciplines us while we are here upon this earth, but the Lord disciplines us as well. So he's marking the argument of how our fa earthly fathers discipline us as compared to what? How God disciplines us. The earthly father, a lot of times, will do it because he is angry or because he is you know, trying to stop some sort of behavior. The Heavenly Father does it for what purpose? For our good. Let's also be honest, sometimes earthly fathers don't always do it for the child's good. <laughs> They're doing it for, I want you just to stop this, right? And you see, that's, that's the difference. So again, you see that idea, all right? Then you have this idea of specification. This, again, this parallelism of specification. All right, turn to Isaiah 45, 12. Specification. Is it the fire of Democrats if he does get confirmed? Will they then say, you know, we need, we need all hands on deck? All right. Yeah, you know, I think we see the words from crisis to crisis these days. I've got all this here. All right. We'll make sure before I erase it. Specification. Now let's look at Isaiah chapter 45, verse 12. Everybody have it? Who wants to read it? Thank you. I have. I have made the earth and have created man on it. I, my hands stretched out the heavens and all their hosts I have commanded. Okay. Now, <clears throat> look at this. Look at, see, he's getting specific here. All right. All right. So God said, first off, I made the earth, right? Well, that's everything. But how specific I created man on it, right? See the specification of that? 
that die stitch. It was my hand that stretched out the heavens. That's general. Now what? Here's the specifics. And I commanded all their hosts. All right. A and C, I made the earth and I stretched out the heavens. Those are real. But B and D focus on something specific in that realm. I created man. I commanded all their hosts. All righty. Go over a couple of pages. Let me give you another example here. That's right. That's right. And again, he goes from that general thing to the specific. And that's what we're talking about, specification here. All righty. <coughs> All righty. All right, let's look here a little further. Explanation. He's going to explain something to us. Turn to Isaiah 48. Isaiah 48, 20 and 21. All righty. Go forth from Babylon, free from the Chaldeans, with a voice of singing, declare, proclaim this, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. They did not thirst when he led them through the de deserts. He caused the waters to flow from the rock for them. He also split the rock and the waters gushed out. So here's this idea. Whenever you think he's, he's talking to him here in Isaiah 48, he could be talking about the time in the future when they were going to come back from the Babylonian captivity. And again, by this time, Isaiah had prophesied about the Babylonian captivity, but the main threat at that point in time as Isaiah is prophesying is not Babylon as much as it's Assyria. But he still talked about the Babylonian captivity. Jeremiah has a lot more to say about it because Jeremiah was prophesying during that particular time frame. So he says, the Lord has redeemed. What does the word redeem mean? Saved. Saved. Buy back. Buy back. Buy back. I think of that a lot of times when I see that little phrase on that coupon. The Lord has bought, bought back his servant Jacob. Now, he compares this in bringing them back from Babylonian captivity. He compares this to what? When he saved them to begin with in Egypt, right? And when he led them through the desert, remember the 40-year wandering in the wilderness? What happened? He caused the waters to flow from the rock for them. He split the rock and the waters gushed out. So what's the, what's the figure that he's trying to get across here in Isaiah? Well, you have got to come back from Babylon, flee from the Chaldeans. Why? Because again, God is going to redeem you, buy you back, put you back in the land. And if you have any doubt about that, all you've got to think about is how God did that and took care of your forefathers in the wilderness by giving them water to drink when they needed it. So you see, there, there's that beautiful part of it. He's explaining it. He's explaining it. All right. <clears throat> Let's go to Psalm 72, verse 9. Psalm 72, verse 9. Psalm um, specification. Um, here's a dramatic effect. A dramatic effect. All right, the dramatic effect. Uh, Psalm 72, verse 9. Who's got that? Read that for me. All right, so the, another translation puts it, the desert tribes, but those who are in the wilderness, right, will what? Bow before him, and his enemies will what? Lick the dust. Now, let's think about that in a, in a literal sense. If they lick the dust, then what? They're groveling before this one, right? Why? The dust is in their face. They're groveling or bowing before, and his enemies will lick the dust in the fact that God is going to punish those who are against him. Now, again, how many of us, whenever we read this particular passage of Scripture, really think about, when I, I'm reading through the book of Psalms, and I read this in Psalm 72, verse 9. Do I really think about the details behind this, of licking the dust, of groveling before God? You know, the idea that God is so powerful that I should grovel in that respect. All right? Let's go to purpose. 
Purpose is another one. Specification, dramatic effect. Here's purpose. That's Proverbs chapter four and verse number one. Listen, my sons, to a father's instructions. Pay attention and gain understanding. So why should they listen? Why should they listen? Why should sons listen to their fathers? <laughs> right, to gain instructions and to gain what? Understanding. How many of us, as we were growing up, listened to our fathers? Most of the time, whenever I listened, it was mainly because I had to. You know what I'm saying? I was afraid if I didn't, I was going to get it. Amen? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there, there, there you go. I don't know what it is about us as men. We sit back. Well, I got this thing figured out. Oh, okay, Dad. I'll, I'll do what you want me to. I, I, just, I don't want to get in trouble, so I'll do what you want me to. And now we become fathers, and we tell our children these things, and they give us the same looks we gave our dads, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can see it even more. You remember, you think about this idea that uh, – I, I watch sometimes my sons deal with their children and I'm sitting there thinking about how I dealt with them and I'm watching the very same looks on their, my grandchildren's face that I saw on their face whenever I was trying to tell them this. And my own sons have come to me a couple of times and they said, boy, we wish we had listened a little bit more on that particular issue, you know, for me, uh, I never knew my father. Mm -hmm. I look back and remember something I used to do. <coughs> and you know, in my circle, I went with dad. She is to my mind, but I can see them. My mind just wanted to wait till you have to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the curse. Yeah. Right? That's the curse, right? <laughs> just wait. So. Here's the purpose. The purpose is that we need to listen to our father's instructions so that we can gain some understanding. And what's the purpose of that? Maybe we won't make the same mistakes they do, but most of us will go right ahead and make that same mistake. Maybe in a slightly different way, we'll make the same mistake. All right. And then you have intensification. 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 Let's go to, and I'm going to give you about two or three passages here. Deuteronomy 32, 30. Deuteronomy 32, 30. <clears throat> the song of Moses, he's teaching them this song before he dies. And he says this, how can one man chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had surrendered them? Again, here's this poetic way of putting it. One chased a thousand. Well, one man didn't just chase a thousand men, did they? It's poetic language. It's the idea that God was so much with one soldier that he could, you know, cause 10. And again, this is one of the, the figurative language that we're talking about. It, it's not literally one causing or chasing 10,000 or a thousand, right? If it's not one chasing a thousand, two couldn't chase 10,000. But what does this suggest? It suggests the idea of God being with them, and that's how much power they, they had in causing these people to fight or fly, flee, fly, flee, fly. Well, okay, all right. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So, there you go. That's it. All right, Proverbs 3, verse 10. Now, we've said a lot of these things out of Proverbs, right? And again, Proverbs is just full of these kind of things. And that could be a great subject to sit down and study one day is the fact how these things are intensifying this. Proverbs 3, verse 10. He says this, Honor the Lord with your possessions, verse 9, and with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Okay. So the idea is, is what do you need to do? You need to honor the Lord first with everything and with the first fruits of all your increase. For what purpose? So your barns will be filled with plenty. Honor the Lord first. 
Now, is this an absolute promise that if I give God first thing that he's just going to make me so rich I can't handle it? No. But it's bringing out that same idea in the fact that there are more blessings than just physical blessings, right? All right. So, again, he's emphasizing that idea that your vats will overflow with new, with new wine. So, there it is. Your vats will burst. Some one particular version would put it. Let's look at Psalms 88. Psalms 88, verses 11 and 12. Psalms 88, 11 and 12. All right. Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? So the idea is, is what? As he's talking about this, I've stretched out my hand to you. Will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? So here's a man that is really despondent about life. He's really wondering about things. So he says, let me ask you something, God. With your loving kindness, can I declare your loving kindness from the grave? Well, nobody can. Why? You're dead, right? You, you can't declare anybody's loving kindness. You can't declare anything from the grave, can you? Can you declare your faithfulness in the place of destruction? No. Can your wonders be known in the dark? Well, again, he's talking about from the grave and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness. So he asked the question, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? My enemies are around me. And, and, and you hear here a, a, a prayer for help. Lord, help me. I've cried out to you day and night. Chapter 88, and verse 1. My soul is full of troubles. Your wrath, he will say in verse 7, lies heavy upon me. You've afflicted me with all your waves. Again, hear this figurative language of the waves. What? They keep coming in and over and over and over again. You ever had one thing go wrong and the next thing you know, four or five things go wrong. And it's just like, wow. And I can't even get my head up to get over the first one. And now I've got to deal with six other things. That's the way he feels. And he says, God, if you're going to allow me to die, I can't praise you in the grave. I can't glorify your name in the grave. So here, here's that intensification. Intensification. So let me just write all this down for you again so that you can get the same idea here. So everybody will have a definite idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about this poetic language and parallelism. Here's the types, types of Hebrew parallelism. Now we read some of this stuff from the New Testament, right? But you got to remember Jesus had this background. So this is something they would all understand. All righty. First off, you would have A equals B which means it is interchangeable, right? This is not a math class, but you get the idea. And so what do you have here? This A and B where things are interchangeable, this is where you have the echo and the contrast parallelism, okay? As I said earlier, years ago, whenever I was first learning this, it was simply synonymous, antithetical, and synthetic. Now you've got all these other ways to look at it. So that's what we're talking about. So that's the first one. All right. A is greater than B. This is the ideal of subordination. And under subordination, you have what? Means, reason, and time. All right. Then you have A is less than B, okay? So here you have the idea of continuation. Continuation, comparison, and specification. And the specification has what? It has some things under it, explanation, or explain something. Dramatic effect. And purpose. And then you have this intensification.
So can you all see that? Gotcha. All right. So here you have these right here. Here's the second group, and there's the third group. And this is the parallelism that we're talking about. But that's not all. <laughs> all right. That's not all. That's not all. <sighs> all righty. So if everybody's got that copy, we'll go on. I'll give you a couple of, some more minutes. You know, years ago, whenever I was in school, I'd have to copy it all down by hand, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nowadays, people take pictures and <laughs> all that other stuff. Oh, okay, all right, good. And, and then I'm not even doing this even that much more. I'm letting you have access to the video after it's all said and done. So if there's something you're not worried or don't know for sure, all you gotta do is go back and look at that part of the video, right? Yeah. Well, that, that works out. Uh, Easy. Easy. Continuation, comparison, C, A is less than B. A starts it off, B will continue it, or you have a comparison, or you have the specification. All that's under A is less than B. Yeah, this is under specification. How does, it, how, he, how does he uh, specify it? He explains it sometimes as a effect or purpose. Okay. No, I'm showing right now the sub at the new gym. So I'm not either. Okay. Jeans uh working on something on my computer, so and now we have a great deal. We have a fair deal, and that's what we want. Oh. Well, sorry, don't make my hand go right around. Well my yeah, I can say tomorrow. All right. All right, everybody done? Bye, James. Bye. All right. So here we go again. All right. Stair tape, stair steps. Stair step parallelism. So what do you think that is? Go upstairs, what are you doing? Taking one step a little bit further, a little bit further, and it keeps going a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further, right? So, for example, Jeremiah 31, 21. Return. Let's just look at it together. Here's a stair step. Jeremiah 31, 21. Side up signpost, make landmarks, set your heart toward the highway, the way in which you went. Turn back, O virgin of Israel, turn back to these your cities. So here's the, here's the stair step. He says, turn back, O virgin, turn back to what? Your cities. It's the ideal again of what? Showing that mercy and allowing them to come back to their land. Uh, he said, how long will you gad about you backsliding daughter for the Lord has created a new thing, a woman shall encompass a man. So here you hear that ideal of a stair step. Return or turn back. You hear the turn, turn back, turn back. Return, Virgin Israel, return to your towns. Another example, Psalms 30, 57, verse 8. Awake, my soul. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. So you see, you have awake, wake up the harp and lyre. Then what? I will awaken the dawn. All right? So there's that stair step. John 1 is one that we could really come into, all right? John 1. See how, the, see how it plays out in John chapter 1, and it's, it's kind of a poetic device. Listen. Uh, listen, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. So you see, you have in the beginning was the Word. So here you have the Word. The Word was with God. Now the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without in, in him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light, and the light 
life, light, the light shine in darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. So notice here this idea of, you know, this one who came into being in him was life. And the life was what? Light. The light. Here are the steps. Here are the steps. So we have life and light. And then the light shined in darkness. And that's kind of what right there. The light and the darkness is kind of an antithetical thing, right? Obviously, you have them on. So the life is the light. The darkness is shining in the darkness, but the darkness did not what? Right. So there's that stair step. <clears throat> All right. Then I remember bringing this idea out, but we're going to talk a little bit more about this, and this is not about where we're going to probably end this evening, maybe. And that's the idea of chiasmus. Chiasmus. Chiasm. Chiasm starts off with a statement A, then B, and then C, and then D, and then C minus, B minus, A minus. So what happens is this D becomes the center, the important statement. So this builds to this, this builds to this, this builds to this, then you have the main point he tries to make, and then this and this, will say the same thing in different ways. This one and this one will say the same thing, and this one and this one will say the same thing, only in different words. Now, this is a poetic event that you find over and over again uh, throughout Scripture. It seems like they do seem to play with this a lot, uh, and a lot of times. Let me give you just a very quick, easy example. Psalm 76, verse 1. Psalm 76, verse 1. If you look at some of the writings about this, some people suggest that there have been entire chapters that have been written this particular way. All righty. So let's look at this. In Judah, God is known. All righty. So here is in Judah, God is what? He's God is what? He's known. He's known. All right. Now, uh, and this is like I said. This is going to be a very easy one. So here you have, and, and this chiasmus could go in much, much bigger detail. All right. But here you have in Judah, God is known. Put this known here. God is known in Judah, right? All right, now, here's the next thing. His name is great. In where? All righty. So there's, there's the chiasmus as it was. In Judah, God is known. His name, you see, B, this, this part and this part go together. His name and God. His name is what? Is known. It's great where? In Israel. Now notice here in Judah and in Israel. You see? You see how they're both fitting together here? So the key, here's the key thing is what? The key thing is God is known. His name, BB, great. This Israel should be down here. Okay, this might make it a little easier. Israel here. So this part goes back up to this part. God and his name are together. Known and great are together. Right? 
That's chiasmus. All right. Now, again, this goes into even that much bigger, bigger thing. Um, let me see if I could portray this other one for you. And this again, this gets kind of interesting as you go into this and really start studying it this way. It gets this real interesting. And but but what's the purpose of us trying to figure this stuff out this way? What's the main point? What's the main point here? God, who's known, is great, right? Where in Israel and in Judah, God is great. That's the main key thought there. That's simple, right? That's the main point. Now, let's look in Jeremiah 2. I don't know if I want to do that or not. <laughs> uh. <coughs> Jeremiah 2, 5 through 9. Thus says the Lord. What injustice have your fathers found in me? They have gone from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters. Neither did they say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through the land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one will cross and where no one dwell. I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its good fruits, but when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. All right, so what's the key point here? The key point is found in verse 7. Here's what God did for them. I bought you into a beautiful, bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness. That's the key point he's trying to get across. But what has happened? You entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where's the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. So look in verse five. Your fathers have followed idols. Verse eight, the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. You see the parallel right there? All righty. So again, as you go follow this thing through, it's A, B, C, D, E, D, B, C, A. All right. And that might be a good thing for you to play with for a while. Might be some a little bit of homework you want to work with a little bit. But it breaks down like this: A, B, C, D, E, D, C, B, A. Woo! Which again. E is going to be the major point, and the major point is found in verse 7. Okay? So if you start looking at this, and you start working this thing out, so you have the first part there where they went into idols, he ends, ends up by talking about them being in idols, right? But you start figuring out how these things work out from the rest of the rest of it. It's an interesting ideal, and it helps us to figure that ideal out. It helps us to see that. Now, as I said, there are some that actually have played with this to the point to where they find entire chapters written as chiasmus. One person, for the life of me, I haven't been able to figure out yet how he did it, actually said one book of the Bible is written as a chiasmus. I cannot remember right off the top of my head which book he tests, but it, it, it suggests that idea of a chiasmus, in that it just repeats itself over and over and over again. <coughs> Uh, all right. So I'm not going to go into a lot more detail than that. As I said, we could spend a lot of time just on that one itself. Um, I wonder if that would have been in the book of Ephesians. It may be, I, and, and I'm thinking that might be the place as well. I'm trying to go through some of my notes here and see where that brings out there. All righty. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. No, I don't think it is uh, because we're going in a lot more detail into a lot of this stuff that's in these books that I'm giving you right now. 
okay? These are some things that have come for, from more of the study of hermeneutics over the last few years as opposed to uh, then. Now, Brother Rose in the book he wrote was back in 2005, but I don't think he's going to uh, go into much detail as I'm trying to here, just try to get some of these ideas across. All right? What are some of the language of poetry? All right? Whenever you think of poetry, what do you think of? Huh? Fancy sayings. Fancy sayings. Okay. Okay. Poetry will have imagery. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Imagery. The imagery there. Uh, in Jehoiakim, in Jeremiah 22, verse 9, Jeremiah says that Jehoiakim will have the burial of a donkey dragged away and thrown outside the gates of Jerusalem. Jehoiakim was not buried with the rest of the kings because Jehoiakim was such a wicked king. So what's interesting is that, again, Jeremiah will describe it in that language, poetic language that he's just going to be dragged and thrown outside the gates of the city of Jerusalem. He was not buried with the rest of the kings. Think about, again, John 10, the good shepherd lays down his life for the what? Do you, do you picture a shepherd fighting a wolf off, putting his life on the line? And again, isn't that the beautiful picture that Jesus is trying to get across to us, how much he loves us and how much he's willing to do for us and help us in that respect? I think so. All righty. I've already talked about this before. So I'm not going to go into a lot more detail about that. Similes and metaphors. Metaphors. Okay, and those are just simple comparisons using like or as. Amos chapter 2, verse 13, I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. Luke 13, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It's like yeast that a woman took and mixed in three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. In Micah 1, at verse 4, the mountains melt beneath him. The valleys split apart like wax before the fire and water rushing down a slope. Now, again, a lot of times when we're reading this passage, we think of mountains, and we think of earthquakes, right? But mountains in Scripture a lot of times is a figurative idea for the ideal of authority. So he would talk about, was there too? The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established above the mountains. He's talking there about the church, remember? So the mountain of the Lord's house will be established above the mountains. And if you have any doubt about that, all you've got to go to Daniel chapter 9, where he sees this, or not Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 2, he sees this image of gold, head, chest and arms of silver, you know, belly and thighs of brass. And then, interestingly enough, a stone cut out of a mountain that shall come and crush that image and grow into a mountain itself. And what is he talking about? The church. The church. So again, you have this, this phrase there. <clears throat> Hosea 13, 7 through 8. I will come upon them like a lion, like a leopard. I will lurk by the path. Like a bear robbed of her cubs, I will attack them and rip them open. Oh, that's beautiful language. Isn't it? I'll just rip them open. Like a lion, I will devour them. A wild animal will tear them apart. Matthew 28. The angel's appearance was like lightning. And his clothing was as white as what? Snow. Metaphors and similes. And then extended simile. The extended simile. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord, that he will be like a tree planted by water, sending out its root by the stream. Well, we think immediately of Psalm 1 here, but this is actually from Jeremiah 17. It shall not fear. This, this tree planted by the water shall not fear when he comes and its leaves shall stay green in the year of drought, and it does not cease to bear fruit. Okay, another, another one is the metaphor. Okay, the metaphor here is, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. It's not like a light, or it's not like a lamp. It is a lamp. It is a light. All righty? Uh, Zephaniah 3.3, 3, her officials are roaring lions. Her rulers are evening wolves. 
who leave nothing for the mornings. Okay? All righty. That's good enough for this week. We've studied a lot, haven't we? Got a lot of ideas across here. We're going to continue to talk about this idea of poetry next week and uh, how to interpret poetic language. And again, try to see the, the, and again, a lot of the things that I've already talked about, about the figurative language is going to come into play here. Then as I foresee it next week, we're also going to talk about these different genres, different kinds of, of narratives in the scriptures and so forth. All righty. Thank you guys so very, very much. Keep up the good work. I will get that test to you this week. I promise. I appreciate you so much, uh, guys. Just keep playing. All right. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All righty. I don't mean to rattle people's brains. I'm just, you know. <laughs>